Hello. Hi, how are you? Good, and you? Good. <laughs> nice to see you. Good to see you too. It's nice to know that you're closer now. Yeah, not now, not so far, just uh, across the sea, <laughs> a smaller <Yeah>. sea. <laughs> the smaller one, exactly. Yeah. How's it gone with your moving now? Yeah, it's fine. Um, I, I'm, I'm renting an apartment just like five minutes walking from the studio. Yeah. I, I'm sharing a studio with a friend of my assistant who is from Hackney, but I'm staying in Peckham, which is southeast. Okay. And uh, it's, it's a nice area, but still, since I arrived in October, everything is closed. So can't really have a feel of the atmosphere of the place. You're originally from Urinios. In... Right, yeah. I'm in the end of my hometown. Yes. <laughs> uh, besides Sao Paulo, how far is it? It's about four hours driving to the west. Yeah, w western town. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So from Brazil, and and uh, it's uh, when reading some previous interviews with you. Uh, I mean, your work has been around for for so many years, and and it, there's really nice writings about how you kind of try not to be bound inside of one category of art. You you mix between the definitions of how you'd like to identify identify your work between painting and sculpture. And uh, one of the materials that is uh, at the center of your practice is uh, these plywood sheets that are taken from construction sites and that uh, their name or their usage is actually topumus. Yeah, is the, the, is the use name of the material when they are used for fencing sites. Yeah, it's more like, like creating a fence. There's a, mm -hmm. this type of enclosure that's called tapumis. Which comes Around. from tapar, it's like uh, like tapar your eyes, like things like that. So it's like right. that prevents from people seeing what is behind. You know, then I bring them. They, the I mean, the work was born with this idea, of making this into an object of viewing, like turning to like kind of painting, but using collage practice to refer to painting and texture and the thickness and those elements. I think it don't, normally they 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 just close the construction site because it's a like a standard practice. They are building, so they they enclose it uh, for people not uh, entering or for, I don't. Of course, might be convenient not to see what's going on sometimes as well. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think um, that when you make when you choose a material that has already. Um, as being part of certain situations in the city, like for example, either uh, development or Sao Paulo is a, is a city that has been very much destroyed and rebuilt, destroyed and rebuilt. You don't have much uh, memory, material memory from what Sao Paulo used to be in the past because everything is always new. They are always knocking down a building and making something new. And uh, so uh, I think that the material has somehow represents that shift that constant uh, movement. And I think it also sometimes can be associated with the uh, with, with precarity of constructions or people that making that first shelter for themselves and then using that because it's a very uh, abundant and very, very, very present and very in cheap accessible material. So something you can take uh, from a dumpster, from any, from a landfill or something like that. Um, and I think that's what also I got influenced at the beginning because it was the students where I was um, going to art school at the Sao Paulo University, they would use all these uh, construction materials that were somehow uh, accessible for them at that time, you know? So with like bricks, uh, sand, or some people work with tiles, some people would work uh, with uh, uh, different types of wood or, yeah. So I think How about... did you go from the shift? Because you also have, and they're, they're, they're available for seeing on your website, it's really beautiful, super colorful paintings. How did you manage to shift from, from painting to this extremely body-like usage of, uh, of material? Yeah, I think it was not a shift. I think it, I started using uh, wood in, in addition and painting. I, I, I keep painting in parallel. 
So it never gave, it was never, it was never a change from one medium to another. But um, I think what happened is that when I was in art school and when I started working with, with, um, with plywood, it was a moment that I was interested in painting as, as a kind of uh, um, painting as a language that uh, also um, talks about this uh, object that is not no longer a window where you see through it, but is like an object that is in the world. So it's like in the same physical space that we are. So I went back to uh, artists that were, were doing researches in that field back in the, the 1940s, 1950s. When they would just take a uh, plaque from the street and, and hang it out, or we would rip uh, advertisements from the street and, re and rework it in, the, in, the, in, a, in a canvas format. Um, and I was, um, I, I think, from that moment, I uh, there was a, a, a step that I did when was to nail instead of producing like. Uh, an object, a painting that you hang somewhere. I, I started to nail the wood directly in in, uh, in, in a wall, mm -hmm. and so the limits of the wall would give the form of the of the artwork. And so then then it changed everything because then uh, I started I had, at that moment I had the option to start to using other materials and and keep the the shape, the format of the of the painting of the picture, or I could. Uh, stay with the same material but then start to change it and to the space and do interact with other uh, different situations in the architecture that I would find in the, all, all different contexts of exhibition that I would be invited to do or to send proposals to and that was I, what I did and then that's how the work uh, started to develop and then um, so I in the first moment, I, I made the woods opening to adjust to a ceiling that was like in, in a triangular shape. And in another situation, I made the wood go around a, a column, and I started to notice that the, the material was flexible. And uh, because at the beginning, when I started with the wood, I was uh, dealing with material that has um, that's made into geometric forms. It was like a re rectangular, and even when it breaks, it still remained the the structure that's uh, behind it is still a grid. And then uh, my, my, but my painting was, was very organic, but, but the paint, in the painting, I was also interested in the, in the surface and how it works. So I was pouring paint and let it flow and creating a work with colors. And uh, I think the colors somehow they are connected also to perhaps the universe of graffiti or something that's also connected to the street, but in another way, and uh, I, I, all the paintings, but the paintings, they would keep an ambiguity. They're, they, they are uh, at the same time that you can see the materiality of the paint on the surface. Uh, you can also uh, understand it with, um, uh, you can also see a virtual space. It's always very difficult to get rid of the, the virtual space unless you go, uh, to, in a minimalist way, like for example, Frank Stella did in the in the 1950s, 60s, that they had these paintings that were shaped in a format, and the lines would follow the format, and then some artists would, would, were working on that very edge. But I didn't want to go again to that same um, way because I think it's very narrow, very difficult. So I, want, I was interested in other things, and I also like wanted to play with the, with the paint and uh, with the materiality. So I, I accepted that uh, virtuality of the, the ambiguity of the painting. And I think one with the, with the work, uh, um, with the plywood work, the, the universe of collage, uh, um, naturally, as I developed it into more and more works, it unfolded into three-dimensional works. Mm -hmm. So I started to exploit this quality of the flexibility, which it would give to the plywood uh, um, quality of organic things which you were already in the painting and now they could be uh, translated into a kind of bubble filling in the in the wood and, and I started to add also other materials that would contribute for that filling. For example, I, in some, in some uh, exhibition I used PVC tubes which is a plastic and the plastic has uh, it behaves very different than wood when the wood is, is, is very dry and brittle, the plastic is very elastic. 
So that combination would give the wood uh, feel like it was an elastic material. So I think I like that. That the point was very important for me because that's when the work um, uh, reached another level because it's there was I say oh this is something new that I'm doing because I I I, I could not think that beforehand and it's not I never worked like planning what like have the whole concept in my head and then just executing right. I think I have I have the concept concepts but I also uh, in the practice that will show me the way and will disclose or other concepts that I could never think before that. Mm. It's really interesting. And it's really curious to hear you saying that you keep on painting on the side because from all the images of exhibitions, large scale exhibitions, even that I've seen from you, there is uh, there has never been paintings exhibited at the same time than your sculptures. Is that the <laughs> choice? There, there, there are there were a few exhibitions. There's quite a long time I don't do that, but uh, but there's uh, many times I do show paintings together with uh, with the installation and the sculptures. I did once in Boulder, who had like many paintings in in Colorado, okay. uh, in the United States. I, I we had uh, about ten paintings and one installation that was a painterly installation with colors as well. So they have this conversation. Uh, I had also in the one in my my two first solo shows in the gallery in São Paulo had a combination of paintings and, and sculptures, installations, and more recently, ten, uh, five years ago, I had in a, in a Galleria Milan in São Paulo I had also a painting among other, but that was more diverse, right. so like different languages, different uh, approaches. There are things that were not wood, were not painting kind of object installations mm -hmm. it's always a bit difficult because i think the paintings themselves they are already have the whole universe so it's diff always difficult to combine with the other uh, works i think i would need one exhibition only with paintings and the other other only with sculptures it might be but some so when i try to combine them there's a, sometimes there's like a I think to be too much for each other, like all this mm -hmm. conflict. <laughs> right, but it's uh, it's really nice. I mean, there are artists and people who work with, uh, you know, always in the background of their work with maybe text or other things. And and I like it how you, you've never really let go of the painting and, and how sometimes it's still visible also in the plywood works because you also work with painting some of them. Your large scale in installations, they are so extremely, uh, intense in the sense that they, they, they really touch, like they, they, they uh, take over the architecture and the infrastructure of a place and it becomes such a bodily experience. Um, and uh, in the titling of your works, you very often refer to organic elements, both of nature, but also of um, human illnesses or conditions. How, yeah. how did you get to that? I think it was, uh, I started to, uh, I think I always had a look at this kind of thing since I was a kid. I remember when I was a child I would open a dead animals to see the organs and things like that. <laughs> um, and um, in, in the drawings, I also drew, sometimes drew corpses and things uh, like that, or, or was, I, I, I used to like drawing uh mo monsters haunted castles things like the the, the the this universe that's a bit mysterious and i think when i started working with the plywood and i and i the 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 bulbous shape of the of those um first installations they were a bit round they suggested a kind of uh tumor like uh mm -hmm. thing because they were also built into the architecture so it was like it could be like a mold situation. It could be an infiltration, something the water was bur about to burst, uh, but also uh, would somehow suggest the idea that the the the, um, the this comparison that the buildings could be seen as a body, and there were like some um, dysfunctional, some some uh, kind of diseases that there are social disease, but they somehow would uh, be given a form, be, be, be given a visuality in mm -hmm. terms of these constructions. And uh, the fact that the material is related to some uh, uh, social conditions that we see in, in developing countries also would make that uh, somehow 
some sometimes uh, perhaps um, um, kind of uh, metaphor for the for those problems, or some, sometimes I like to say to give a, to give a, um, to give a face to a problem that's otherwise hidden under the rug, you mm -hmm. know. <laughs> So we become that visible uh, somehow, but not in an obvious way, but right. in a way that makes people think and, and reflect about what's happening there. So it's never something, it's never a, it's never a content that is explicit, but is, it has to be reached through the means of the art language or the sculpture or a poetics that somehow will have more uh, powerful impact on the, the people that they're seeing will re remain in their memory. Mm -hmm. uh, which is different than if you if I would just write, for example, an advertisement and and say something about that, it can, it will be a direct message you can right. read and understand right on, but you can easily forget. So mm -hmm. I think art has this characteristic of being something that will remain, you know, and will will have a, a long lasting effect on society mm, because of being more of a of the experience of a feeling rather than being uh, kind of reading a statement in a certain way it is it is uh, i really enjoy that because within the within the exhibition at uh, at nitya right now the the context is the one of trying to approach resistance between uh, like within within the society from different groups and and different communities and there are several works that have literally are, are text works, so they are statements. And then your works in the in the group exhibition are instead uh, very very bodily, really felt when one comes in and when one's approached them. But as you say, they're they're kind of silent. They 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 have this shape, but they're not telling you straightforward their intention and we've had a lot of fun with this with the curatorial team because each one of us would add different uh, connotations to them and uh, the works in the show is this uh, chest um, chest of drawers and the clock and and a couch two uh, there are three furnitures that have been modified two of them mainly with woods and the couch has a lot of metal elements and rust as well and uh, when we were placing them into the rooms and when we finally had them in front of us, we had these long conversations <laughs> about what we were reading in them and what were they making us think. And uh, for example, based on, on my cultural heritage, for me, the, the chest of drawer was about these dreams and one that one places into, you know, the nightside table and you kind of place them there and wait that there is the right moment or who knows if ever in life you'll be able to achieve them but they're kind of stored there and uh, and in the the piece the the drawer is kind of open and there's this thing coming out of them and uh, my absolute favorite one is actually the couch i think somehow because it has a stronger roughness or it really takes me uh, and and uh, when walking around the couch on the back side of it there is this uh, the, you can see basically the entrails the, the intestine the stomach of it and it, it made me think of when kind of this how today news from around the world they enter our living room they enter our intimate space and our our households by by news and with the TV and how a lot of them are grave, uh, you know, shows or news of really dark things and, and problematics and things that are happening around. And sometimes you just feel this heaviness of, of like watching at your screen and being there without really being able to move, but it, it has entered your most intimate space. And, uh, and then, you know, you kind of keep it there. It's like, it just stays inside. So, and then my colleagues had completely different readings. Of it, so it, but it was really nice to, to read those. Have, when you made these pieces and when you started working with furniture, how, how did it come about? Yeah, I think it was interesting what you said about the things that enter our house, the this kind of violence and and, and this uh, problems of the world and things. But then you just made the me remember when I was a kid, uh, TV would show things more explicit. 
Like for example, there was a bomb a a attempt, I remember in the eighties, I don't remember what it was, but I remember seeing like someone with the, with the without an arm and some head, some uh, dismembered this bodies. We could see photos like that in the newspaper a little bit, but they were starting to curb it already. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was even more explicit back in the 1960s, 50s, but then the media start to uh, somehow filter. So it, it's, it, they kind of make up, they never show something that's offensive, that, that a, a, a family is gonna be reading the newspaper in the, in the, in the, in the breakfast, you know, like in those margarine uh, butter uh, advertisements. And then it's gonna be something unpleasant. So the, the media filters it. But with social media, with the WhatsApp and things that people uh, circulate, somehow these uh, crude uh, raw images are going back into life. So people send, so there was like for decades, I wouldn't see something like an accident or a horrible thing happening. But then sometimes you are, someone pulls you into a WhatsApp group and some people just post some thing like that, you know, someone falling down from a building. So, um, and, uh, but back to the, so, to the issue of the furniture. I think the, the furniture, I don't know, it's, um, it's it, it might be there. I think parts of it might be ob obvious to say that, but my my father always had a furniture shop in my hometown. Mm -hmm. So I was used as a child to go to the to the shop, to the go, he had a, a carpentry facility where they, they, some people would produce for him uh, to sell like, um, uh, tables, chairs, couches, things like that. Uh, so that was very present in my universe. So I think that, that I'm familiar with the furniture for that reason. And also, I think the this connection that the, the furniture can be also uh, somehow a place for the for the bodies is a kind of extension of the, our of our bodies. So I think this all these things leads to this context. And I think they have also an element of there's a bit uh, surreal. I think surrealism is something that I was being always interested since I started uh, studying art, I've been always drawn to uh, psychoanalysis and uh, re reading lots of Freud, Freud books. I have a good friend who's a, a psychologist and he would uh, recommend me some books and we discussed that at, at, at the beginning when I was starting to paint. And um, and surrealism is something that uh, has already uh, has a, a direction, both surrealism and, uh, and uh, afterwards uh, abstract expressionism. They have this root into the unconscious and to the, this uh, theories of the unconscious, into the dreams, into these things. And I, I I think all these things they sometimes they appear in my work. I don't I don't think of them rationally, like say, oh, I'm gonna do something to look surrealist or to have this weird thing. But I somehow the the ideas come to my mind, and I when I'm sketching, and then I I draw a table, and then the drape, the table transform into an organic shape. I don't know what what it is at the at the, at the moment, but then it, uh, as I develop it, it transforms into something else, and then I go to the real space and to produce the work, and then it becomes something totally different. But uh, I think that's. There, there is always a sense of transformation that things mm -hmm. they don't uh, they, they, things transform from one thing into another a sense of continuity of the matter that, that's never ending but always changing. Uh, just, just to tell uh, just, that couch is uh, I, I was going to say that I forgot that couch that you say like he he used to be in my house since I was a kid. He was, oh. He was, yeah, he, my, I think my mom bought them when I was like maybe 10 years old or something like that. And so it was in my house for a long time. And then once my mom didn't want it anymore, then I took to the studio and then he stayed in the studio for many years. And then it was in a very bad state. And one day my assistant brought a new uh, couch from his house. He said, hey, let's trash this one. And, the, the, and as they put the couch there to be trashed, I, I came on this, this and I started making a work. <laughs> but that, that also brings many stories. <laughs> One day I tell you. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's nice to hear about the background story of the couch. What about the other two furniture, the clock and the chest of drawers? Like, where did these came from? Yeah, the, the chest of drawers I made when I was in a residency in Paris. Uh, 
and I, I, I wanted to do uh, some some sculpture. I think it was the first small sculpture that I did. I, said, I want to do something really small. I was in Paris, and I and I was uh, was during the time I made the, the piece at the Palais de Tokyo. Yeah. I was there for five months, and the the Palais de Tokyo is you only worked on that project for about three two months. So before that start, I I had I just went to buy some furniture and I and I made that piece. And um, and and the other one was also made in Paris. The the clock, the clock I think was I made I somehow it's more uh, it reminds more of a human body and it's a clock so it's a bit I think it brings a little bit the idea of the time and the mm -hmm. gravity pulling down the, co the corpse you know. <laughs> And uh, but the, the, the there is also this idea of the wood the wood transforming to something that's kind of flash that somehow um, recalls this there is this sense of the of the time it pulling down and the and the uh, it, and it's also again this, a little bit of this surrealist component um, and the chest of drawer I think it is more like about. Uh, the, the thing that's next to a drawer, but it's a little bit like a disturbing, be, be a nightmare, be, be a little bit like um, uh, an object that somehow becomes alive or or uh, may recall you something that you, is not very easy, but at the same time is not something that you can talk about because it's like in a dream that you, you perceive things and you have feelings, but you don't know exactly what's happening, you don't know how to nominate them. I, this idea of the fluidity, you know, the idea of that uh, liquid, and you know, uh, was I think Fro it was Freud who used to say that uh, water was the the symbol of the dreams, in, in because of this sense of of something that doesn't have a shape. The shape of the water is where it is contained. And I think the 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 objects they are always something very rational, very uh, practical, and designed in a way that's to serve to a, a purpose. And I think when you, you the turning it back somehow into a, a natural form, an organic form, something that uh, suggests the idea that's uh, that's also liquid, that's also something that tends to um, an entropic situation. Then. And, and I think that co connects with also with the idea of dream and something that's just next to our head is so familiar, but at the same time, you don't know what it is. I like this uh, reference to water and nightmares. I think a lot of people can relate. Uh, I mean, sleep is such a <laughs> absolute uh, crazy thing and how, and how humans have the ability of talking of a story of something that uh, that hasn't happened or that is not present or that others cannot experience and how do we describe that and how do we speak of it and, and also the fluidity of how movements and elements and contexts and things kind of interlace with each other within nightmares and dreams it's it's so extremely peculiar and and it's very often that when talking about them back into this world it's so strange. I was wondering if there was anything in your sketchbooks or in your imagination that will soon come to life. Oh yeah, she probably will. Yeah, <laughs> there is always something going on in the sketchbook. And then when there is a <laughs> proposal for a project, I go back there, have a look. Say, okay, let's. I think this project might fit there, or sometimes this is a specific place, and that I have nothing would fit there. I will start thinking about from the the place proposed and then back to the sketching according to that situation get something designed specifically for that so it depends yeah we'll see what happens have you have you ever had some some people that watched your work and that uh, and that shared with you some thoughts that uh, would have never come to your mind or that touched you particularly Oh yeah, it happens all the time. You make a when you make a work, you don't think about their, all the possible interpretations. But people turn up and they and they see things and they suggest things. And sometimes what they said becomes the starting point for another work. <laughs> right. That's not too bad. I haven't thought about that. Oh, that's interesting. And it stays on your mind. And then you, you when you are 
planning something new, some suddenly that appears and you don't remember where it came from, then you will know, oh yeah, the person said that. It has been such a such a pleasure being able to have your work for the public here in Norway. It has been very different from how we had planned it nearly two years ago when we started talking. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's a uh, it's really a uh, it was a long lasting dream. I can tell you that the first week of uh, me working at the art center, I remember Rike showing me a picture of your work. So finally, and and luckily, who knows? Maybe we'll manage something bigger. But at least meeting each other. Yeah, yeah, that would be very nice. Yeah. Let me know when you come to London. We'll come yeah. to see the studio and continue our conversation. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for 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 wanting to have this uh, this video interview and being and being open with uh, with our public, although digitally. And uh, we'll keep in touch soon. Yeah, sure. Thank <laughs> you. Very nice talking to you. Thank you for this invitation. Yes, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye.